everyone in Southeast Asia, good afternoon and good evening to all of you around the globe who are tuned in today. A warm welcome to you all. My name is Rocky Guzman. I'm the Deputy Director of the Asian Research Institute for Environmental Law, and I'm honored to be the moderator for today's first session, the fourth session of the second ASEAN Environmental Law Conference on Transboundary Wildlife Crime, where we focus on policies and practices on wildlife crime in Southeast Asia. This has been a very important topic, particularly in this region, especially today. So I'm really excited to hear more about the recent developments on this issue. But just a short background. The reality is in Southeast Asia, it's, the heart, it's, the heart, it's at the heart of the wildlife trade, which is a pity as it's home to some of the most biodiverse regions on earth. The reported trade in this region is astounding and it comes with an array of crime and illegal activities such as poaching and trafficking. Just some hard and fast facts, almost 100,000 kilograms of pangolin scales were seized in Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam in two years alone, from 2017 to 2019. Other targets include tigers, turtles, bears, from within the region and also sourced abroad. Uh, world, worldwide, illegal wildlife trade is one of the most profitable forms of illicit trade. It's a transnational organized crime across, border work, or across borders worth tens of billions of dollars. In many places in Southeast Asia, challenges abound in stamping out the existence of these organized criminal networks. Now for today, the panel will look at where we're at now in addressing transboundary wildlife crime in Southeast Asia especially in terms of legal and policy frameworks. We'll also focus on initiatives that seek to solve the issue at its core through existing and upcoming programs being undertaken to solve the issue. We look forward to hearing all these solutions that we hope to see scaled up all across the region. But before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the organizers of this event, Ariel, with the support of the Asian Development Bank, the United Nations Environment Program, and USAID. We also express gratitude to all our supporters, 17 organizations in all, who made this event possible. We thank our three esteemed panelists for today's session for their insights and expertise. So after this panel session, we'll have a Q&A, although you can ask questions throughout the duration of the presentations by typing them in the question box below in your screens. Please be informed that we are also live at our Facebook page in ARIO, and you can check that out even after the session ends. So without further ado, let's start with the panel. We're honored to have our first panelist, Sally Yang. So Sally is a law and policy specialist in environmental crime, particularly in the area of counter wildlife trafficking. She has worked on USAID counter wildlife trafficking program since 2014 across the ASEAN region, where she advanced strategic partnerships around policy, law enforcement, prosecution, and judicial capacity. Most recently, Sally joined UNEP as a program officer in the law division and will support activities under the project addressing environmental challenges through the law. Prior to her work in environmental crime, Sally was a litigation lawyer in Singapore across the infrastructure, environmental, and renewable energy sectors. Now, Sally, thank you very much for joining and over to you. Thank you, Rocky. And um, would someone be sharing my PowerPoint, please? Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rocky. Uh, and uh, thank you to Georgia and Amanda uh, in the keynote uh, address. Uh, they have aptly set the scene and tone for this session uh, on transboundary wildlife crime and also for session five, which I'll be moderating. As law and policy are the backbones of combating wildlife crime, including uh, particularly transboundary organized wildlife crime, I shall attempt to give you a brief overview of the regional policy and legal framework in combating wildlife trafficking. It's impossible to be comprehensive in the time given, so my apologies in advance for brevity. If we have time, um, I don't think so, but if we have time, we shall touch upon what regional legal instruments and mandates that are already in place to counter wildlife trafficking and what else is needed in the lessons from the COVID-19 outbreak and from a One Health perspective. 
For the presentation, um, the term wildlife trafficking and illegal wildlife trade or IWT have been used interchangeably, but for all intents and purposes, they have similar context here. Also, when I mention AMS, uh, I mean ASEAN member state, uh, sometimes I lapse into acronym. So here you can see that these are the regional and some of them are international policy and mandate within ASEAN on counter wildlife trafficking. Um, ASEAN as a region has several policies to address wildlife trafficking issues. Uh, ASEAN bodies, including ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly, uh, IPA for short, ASEAN Ministerial Meeting on Agriculture and Forestry, uh, AMA, ASEAN Ministerial Meeting on Transnational Crime, and ASEAN Apol have all taken steps and made resolutions or declarations to support combating wildlife trafficking. In the most recent mandate, um, on March 2019, a special ASEAN ministerial meeting on illegal wildlife trade was convened in Thailand. Uh, incidentally, Thailand is the lead shepherd in counter wildlife trafficking in the ASEAN Working Group on CITES and Wildlife Enforcement. Um, this meeting resulted in the Chiang Mai Declaration of the ASEAN Ministers responsible for CITES and Wildlife Enforcement on illegal trade in wildlife. So the Chiang Mai Declaration effectively laid the platform and direction for the development of the ASEAN Regional Plan of Action on combating illegal wildlife trade for the next five years. Um, the declaration highlighted the following actions, strengthening cooperation in addressing the illegal wildlife trade in ASEAN, strengthening demand reduction efforts across the region, strengthening regional actions to tackle the illicit financial flow associated with illegal wildlife trade. Um, and this will be interesting when Sylvia will be talking about anti-money laundering laws and wildlife crime. Um, enhancing domestic legislation to give deterrent effect to wildlife offenses uh, and closing wildlife market where it contributes to IWT. Um, this was fortuitous because this was um, declared prior to the pandemic and this has become very, very relevant in terms of wildlife market and how it contribute to or how IWT contribute to the transmission of zoonotic diseases. The two main working bodies in ASEAN that deals with illegal wildlife trade are as you can see, the ASEAN Working Group on CITES and Wildlife Enforcement, which is under the economic pillar under ASEAN umbrella, the Senior Officials Meeting on Transnational Crime, which has its own working group on wildlife and timber trafficking. This sits within the political security pillar. In 2020, the ASEAN Working Group on CITES and Wildlife Enforcement um, developed the action plan for 2021 to 2025, basically a five-year plan. Uh, using the Chiang Mai Declaration as a platform and a policy mandate. So IWT as a transnational organized crime involve a number of international conventions and treaties. And it is crucial that we look at not just wildlife laws, but also other laws that can be used to investigate and prosecute wildlife crime. In the interest of time, I can only touch on the relevance of CITES and the UN Convention on Transnational, Organi uh, Transnational Crime. But you can see there are others that relates to customs, relates to um, 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 uh, anti-money laundering, uh, anti-corruption, uh, which are something that uh, can be delved into uh, in many more sessions. Um, so uh, coming back to CITES, right? CITES being the Convention on International Trade for Endangered Species um, of Flora and Fauna, all 10 ASEAN member states are parties to the CITES. So CITES is an international agreement between the governments and serves to both facilitate legal, sustainable and traceable trade. And in the more recent years to intercept illegal wildlife trade uh, with the formation of IQIC. With wildlife conservation, uh, wildlife conservation and protection laws in many ASEAN member states were drafted or amended pursuant to the CITES requirements. Um, but this will sometimes create legislation inconsistency and conflicts as CITES does not necessarily deal with the full spectrum of law enforcement and criminality of wildlife crimes, especially those involving transnational and organized wildlife crime. 
The inherent conflict of interest between the CITES management and law enforcement prevails. Further, CITES covers only endangered species classified as appendices one, two, and three. And that is a loophole if we look at zoonotic diseases because they do not necessarily come from CITES listed species. So how do we deal with that? Oops. Um, just very briefly on the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime. All 10 ASEAN member states are party to the UNTO. Um, states that ratify this instrument commits themselves to take serious, take a series of measures against transnational organized crime, which include the creation of predicate domestic criminal offenses. This is important because for most part, wildlife trafficking is not a poverty crime, but that of wealth both from the perspective of perpetrators and the consumers. Ivory, rhino, and tiger products, for example, are all high value commodities going into tens of thousands, even millions of dollars. This means organized syndicates are very often behind and profiteering from the illegal wildlife trade. While the poor village poachers end up in jail, the kingpins of such criminal syndicates remain free by applying laws pertaining to organized crime money laundering and corruption, the resources to combat illegal wildlife trade by organized criminals increases and legal repercussions become more severe for the wildlife criminals. Um, we're very uh, honored to have a public prosecutor here who will elaborate on the importance of mutual legal assistance when it comes to combating illegal wildlife trade and Sylvia from the US Department of Justice that will speak on using anti-money laundering laws in wildlife cases following my presentation. So um, pursuant to the development of an updated ASEAN handbook on legal cooperation to combat the legal wildlife trade as a key deliverable, deliverable for 2021 under the uh, five-year plan of action for ASEAN Working Group on CITES and Wildlife Enforcement, which I've mentioned earlier, ASEAN had conducted an updated review of the wildlife-related laws um, in over 20 key provisions relating to that. This slide gives a, an example of what the table of comparison looks like. So we actually do a comparison of all 10 ASEAN countries and listed 10, uh, listed a, a series of key provisions that are relevant to, to um, wildlife trafficking. The good news is all ASEAN member states have laws to regulate the illegal wildlife trade. Provisions such as hunting, trading, import, export, re-export, transit and possessions are addressed in their wildlife laws. However, the ASEAN member state laws are not consistent, especially when it comes to penalties in the region. This is an overview of the key provisions uh, used in the legal review. I'm not expecting you to be able to read all of that, but just so you can see that by providing a list of key provisions for com com combating wildlife crime in national wildlife legislation, the aim is to highlight the relevant topics the ASEAN member state should con contemplate when considering effective wildlife legislation. The key provisions address critical aspects of wildlife trafficking, as I've mentioned before. They also include enabling mechanisms such as protected species review mechanism, handling and disposal of confiscated wildlife, compensation, reward for informants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The key provisions identify elements that constitute um, wildlife crime. As such, they go beyond the basic requirements of CITES in the national legislative compliance which should be the case. So um, just want to give you an overview. Again, you know, there's too much information to be shared in a short period of time that I have. Um, we use four key offenses here uh, relating to trade, import, export, possession, and transit as a baseline and map the imprisonment terms and fines within the ASEAN region. And you can see that the penalties for wildlife trafficking offenses were greatly varies greatly among the ASEAN member states from zero to 15 years imprisonment terms. Um, here is the same thing with the um, fines. It ranges from zero to US, US dollars, 88,000 in fine with the highest cap of about 380,000. The disparity, so why, why are we showing this? The disparity of the penalties within the region means criminals can operate in countries that have lower penalties, therefore creating a safe haven or hotspot for them to operate. 
penalties need to be strengthened and harmonized across the region for uh, counter wildlife trafficking efforts to be effective. We need to start treating illegal wildlife trade um, and wildlife trafficking basically as a serious trans-organized crime. So wildlife trafficking is a highly specialized field in criminal enforcement, which requires specialized knowledge and procedures for effective enforcement. While ASEAN was the first global and has been successful in creating a regional wildlife enforcement network for the investigation of wildlife crime, two other, disciplinary action, uh, two other discipline areas can benefit from such cooperation and specialization. Um, the prosecution, which we have two representatives here and the judiciary. There is a growing momentum within ASEAN for the establishment of um, environmental courts. A few ASEAN member states already have environmental divisions set up within their court system, including Thailand, and training environmental prosecutors and judges. But more needs to be done, in particular on wildlife trafficking cases, including having rules of procedure and sentencing guidelines for environmental or wildlife crime cases. For now, in ASEAN, only the Philippines have appointed special counsels for prosecution of environmental crime and dedicated rules of procedure for environmental cases. Thailand has environmental divisions in their court and Indonesia has environmental judges to preside over environmental cases. Having specialized prosecutors and judges as the last bastion in the enforcement continuum will be a significant game changer in the region and will set an example to the rest of the world. A little bit on sentencing guidelines. Now, there's no point in having good laws and high penalties without sensible sentencing guidelines to ensure that the punishment corresponds with the crime. Within the region, the Supreme Court in Sabah, Malaysia has developed such a tool in collaboration with WWF Sabah, and I'm hoping that um, the rest of the region will follow suit at some point, if not specifically for wildlife crime, at least for environmental crime. Um, I'm not sure how much time we have, um, but I do like to spend a couple of minutes on One Health. The pandemic has raised the profile of the need for a One Health approach in the management of health of the public, the animals and the environment. The management of wildlife trade, both legal and illegal, forms an, inter an, an integral part of this One Health approach. The latest One Health operational definition developed by FAO, OIE, WHO, Tripartite and UNEP, in fact, very recently it has become a quadrupart uh, quadrupartite, um, the, the One Health High Level Expert Panel states, One Health is an integrated unifying approach that, amend, um, that aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animal, and ecosystem. It recognizes the health of humans, domestic and wildlife animals, and wild animals, plants, and the wider environment uh, are closely linked and interdependent. The approach mobilizes multi-sector disciplines and communities at varying levels of society to work together to foster well-being and tackle threats to health and ecosystems while addressing the collective need for clean water, energy, air, safe and nutritious food. Now, why am I talking about this at this stage when we're talking about wildlife crime? It's because it was set the scene to um, providing a snapshot of where we are in ASEAN on the regional policy framework in IWT and the One Health collaboration and coordination. In October 2016, the ASEAN Coordination Center for Animal Health and Zoonosis, be prepared for a lot of acronyms here, ACCAHZ, was established to provide a comprehensive, integrated, and concerted regional approach to coordinate national approaches in animal health and zoonosis measures, including disease surveillance, diagnosis and control and quick response. Uh, it provides the policy and technical advisory support to ASEAN Secretariat Working Group on Livestock and other relevant ASEAN bodies. Because of COVID-19, the ASEAN Coordination Council, ACC, has been designated to coordinate and provide oversight in the ASEAN collective response to the pandemic. So why is this relevant to wildlife trafficking? The ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework, ACRF, was adopted in November 2020 
which included a comprehensive implementing, uh, implementation plan. Now, under the resilience strategy, the ASEAN Working Group on CITES and Wildlife Enforcement has been tasked to promote awareness of the risk of zoonotic diseases spread through the illegal wildlife trade and to support the, form the formulation of the, uh, recommendations and policy briefs to minimize this risk from wildlife trade and high risk consum consumptive behavior. This includes measures to address wildlife trafficking from the viewpoint of the biodiversity conservation sector and to enhance cross-sectorial coordination in the enforcement of wildlife protection laws. Until recently, most multi-sectorial, multidisciplinary One Health coordination efforts within ASEAN do not include comprehensive wildlife and biodiversity management in their agenda. And we're hoping that with the um, direction with the ACRF, that would change. <coughs> right, so having addressed that, right, uh, I thought I would finish my presentation with a slide where us, on where ASEAN stand on anti-money laundering laws and mutual legal assistance in relation to wildlife trafficking, just to set the scene for the next two speakers. MLA, Mutual Legal Assistance. Now all 10 ASEAN member states are signatory to the ASEAN Treaty on Mutual Legal Assistance, uh, which Kuntira will elaborate on. However, only eight ASEAN member states extended it to wildlife trafficking crimes. Um, for um, for anti-money laundering laws, all 10 ASEAN member states have anti-money laundering laws with wildlife trafficking as a predicate offence. And now it will be interesting to hear from Sylvia on how anti-money laundering laws can be used to effectively combat wildlife trafficking. Um, and, uh, and finally, before I thank everyone in closing, I would like to acknowledge that the information that I have presented here will compiled as a result of my previous work at various USAID wildlife program and contribution from ASEAN member states in our support to ASEAN in the development of their regional plan of action and also the development of the ASEAN handbook on legal cooperation to combat wildlife crime. Other organizations such as the BWF and OIE contributed to the handbook as well. So um, thank you very much for listening to me and um, we'll hear from Tira. Thank you very much, Sally, for that very comprehensive uh, explanation of the legal and policy frameworks in ASEAN International. I, I love what you said about uh, focusing on regional action and all those domestic le legislation as well. And I look forward to also reading about the handbook for domestic legislation and more about that one health approach and how we can implement it in our domestic jurisdictions. Now, as you've said, uh, we now proceed to another speaker. Uh, our next panelist is Tirat Limpayaraya. Tirat is a public prosecutor at the Office of the Attorney General in Thailand with a demonstrated history of working in the judiciary. His expertise covers international law, criminal law, arbitration, dispute resolution, extradition, mutual legal assistance in criminal matters, and environmental crime, specifically waste and wildlife crime. He has strong legal foundations with a master's of law focused in alternative dispute resolution, corruption law, international law from New York University, Penn Law in Georgetown. Everyone, let's all welcome Pirat. Pirat, you have the floor, please. Hi, uh, hi good morning. Thank you, Rocky, for my introduction. Good morning, everyone uh, from around the world, I believe. Uh, that's 201 participants so far. Um, today, I would like to talk about the cooperation across border. Let me share the screen. Okay, so here's my turn. Um, today, I would like to talk about the cooperation across border. As you heard from Sally, that um, that's a cooperation related to the MLA. Um, but I will talk about other things, uh, including the MLA as well. So the importance of cooperation between law enforcement. When we talk about the law enforcement uh, cooperation, imagine how important it is. Um, imagine that if you have the crucial piece of evidence about um, such as 
financial transaction identity of company person, uh, witness statement, and some picture evidence, or even the detail of the past sale, and we need it in the court. And there's no cooperation. What is going to happen? Um, there will be no proof, and the accused person can walk away and free like a bird. So what? Well, I would like to draw some point that I find is very important of the corporation first. Um, the corporation can bring the intelligence sharing. We can share information we have between the law enforcement. Uh, recently, I have an um, extradition case, uh, Malaysian extradition case, very important one. And there's one document in the paper mentioned about some specific term using in Malaysia court. And the court asked me, in the morning, what does it mean? And I, I didn't know, but actually it's very important. It's about uh, advanced hearing from the victim. So I call my colleague, uh, I, I would say my friend, the Malaysian prosecutor uh, during the lunchtime. And then I got back on track in the court in the afternoon and explained that to the judge. So this is uh, the type of intelligence sharing uh, for me. The second part is the exchange knowledge ask uh, to please uh, presentation mode, the, the put it on presentation mode. Yes. Can you hear me? The PowerPoint, yeah. Could you please put it on presentation mode? Uh, yes, okay. Hold on. Thank you. Is it ready? Oh, I did. Because we see the PowerPoint, but it's not on presentation mode. Oh, okay. Maybe that's what's going to happen. Could you could you share the presentation that I sent you last night? Is it there? Okay. Uh, okay. I think that is okay. Sorry for that. <laughs> okay. So so now we ready to go. Go ahead, please. All right. Okay. So the second is the exchange of no not the knowledge. Um, it's very important to learn something from others when we may not know. Uh, for example. Like nine years ago, I experienced the first thing about the cryptocurrency and I don't know at all. And this day, the cryptocurrency became really important. And uh, thank you for the information sharing during the meeting. And I came to some wildlife knowledge uh, for my 10 years of practice. Uh, for example, when we have the DNA of the elephant, the DNA of the elephant actually can be separate and can be differentiated between Asian elephant and African elephant. So that part of it is very important to know and to share the exchange, the knowledge. And uh, thirdly is uh, building the network. Building the network is very, very important. It's much easier to know someone from the other side, as I mentioned before. Um, when I know the Malaysian prosecutor, I can just talk to him directly and to get information right away, uh, not to try to get the paper uh, answer from him. And the lastly is to getting the evidence to a certain channel, which I will uh, elaborate more in my presentation. Next, please. Okay, what type of the cooperation across border do we have? I would like to share uh, my knowledge about the cooperation across border in two forms, uh, which, which are the foundation of the cooperation to combat uh, crime, including wildlife crime. First is formal cooperation. The second is informal cooperation. Next, please. Uh, formal cooperation uh, also can be divided into types, major two types. I would like to highlight uh, which are mutually consistent in criminal matters and extradition, but due, due to the time limit, I will not go through the detail of the law. So I will touch uh, upon only some important part of uh, this type of cooperation. Next, please. What is the mutual legal assistance in criminal matters? Um, actually, it's the formal form of request to obtain the evidence through the uh, central authority of each country. And why, why do we need to obtain it through the representative of each country. Um, it's very important because um, I think it's kind of the universal law of each country that uh, when you obtain the evidence through the MLA channel, uh, in general, the evidence can be admissible in the court. 
So that is very, very important uh, how, how the law enforcement try to obtain the evidence. And um, what type of the assistance that the MLA can do? Actually, it's anything that related to criminal matters. Um, I would like to draw some points that the MLA can do. Uh, first, inquiry and producing evidence, uh, produce, for provision of documents and information in the possession of government agencies, serving document, search and seizure, locating person, initiate criminal proceeding, for feature seize of the property asset recovery and other types of assistance such as um, hold the meeting between the law enforcement across the border. Just for example, next please. And then there's another type is expedition. I think everyone already familiar with the expedition. Um, I will not really go into the detail of expedition, but I would like to say that the fugitive can be expedited for two reasons. First of all, to be prosecuted. Second, to be imprisoned. So that's a difference between these two. Um, I will tell you the detail later if I have a chance in the next meeting or other meeting at the seminar that we see each other. Um, each year, Thailand received a lot of extradition requests um, from around the world. Since I believe that Thailand may be the positive safe haven for some sense, and we have expedited many this year. Uh, during this uh, last year alone, I expedited four or five positives. I mean, only for my case, we have like um, almost 20 prosecutors in the International FBI Division. So that can be a lot um, in each year. Next, please. Then we come to another type of uh, cooperation, which is uh, informal cooperation. In for cooperation is very uh, extremely important for law enforcement. I would like to uh, highlight some important form of uh, informal cooperation. First, FIU to FIU, uh, the financial intelligence unit, is very important to gather the financial information, financial transactions to identify the financial transaction of the criminal. So just like the word, uh, the sentence, um, follow the money. The second one is Interpol. Interpol actually is very important. It's a cooperation between the police and it's become more imminent uh, by year. Um, that reflects the cooperation to many types of notice as you've been aware of like red notice, green notice, white, white notice, black notice. But the far the one that people know the most is red notice. I just saw one movie in Netflix talking about the red notice. Um, is actually to notify the country uh, regarding the person who has the arrest warrant. But it depends on each country law whether they can use the red notice um, as the arrest warrant in that country or not. But in Thailand, no, we need to use it as the evidence to get the arrest warrant in Thailand again if that person has the red notice aboard. Next, please. Then I would like to draw some of the very important case study regarding the wildlife uh, mutual ecosystem. This case actually can be uh, good and bad and some uh, successful and challenge example of the mutual ecosystem in Thailand. Um, it's the case study related to the Kenya uh, African ivory. Sorry. Next, please. Okay, the detail of the MLA request is really broad, um, but I will tell you um, in the scenario. First, there's the MLA request from Kenya to Thailand in 2015. Then we have the MLA request from Thailand to Kenya in 2015 as well. Then we have the MLA request from Kenya to Thailand in uh, 2017. And lastly, we have, uh, I would say, so-called ad hoc task force aimed to extract the DNA from the 1,312 packs in 2020. Next, please. Um, in, uh, in 2015, we received the MLA request from Kenya to Thailand. I will give you the background of the case first. Um, that's an illegal shipment uh, declared to be some other product and the shipment came to the port of Thailand. And it 
it appeared that it became like a lot of elephant ivory inside the container. So the Kenya sent the mutual legal assistance to Thailand almost right away. Uh, what what the Kenya wants to let the Thailand do? Uh, there's many things, but I would like to highlight only some part first to extract the DNA of 511 packs. Um, this one is already been executed through the DNP uh, Department of National Park and the Royal Thai Police. But unfortunately, that's a complication of the DNA extraction. Um, in Thailand, we have some limitation of how we can uh, extract the DNA. We can separate the differences between DNA of Asian elephant and African elephant. But what the Kenya authority want is uh, the DNA of the origin. Uh, it's not enough to, to, to show that it's actually the DNA of the African elephant, but in the detail, it can show that where the elephant uh, originated, for example, Kenya, Congo, and other sides of uh, Africa. So that is one of the problems, but however, we sent the, the result of the execution to Kenya anyway. Second one is to allow Kenya uh, officer entering to Thailand for investigation and gathering the evidence. Unfortunately, it's also, uh, it cannot be executed because um, you know, like the sovereignty of each country. Um, in Thailand, in Thai law, we cannot allow other uh, investigators to come to investigate or uh, gathering the evidence by themselves. They can do only by the observer. And the third one is to take the statement of custom officer. Actually, this one can be executed, but the Kenya authority didn't, didn't submit the question list uh, to us, so we cannot execute this request as well. And the lastly is to return the shipment, I mean the container and all ivory to Kenya. This one is actually really problematic. Um, Kenya wants uh, all the ivory back to Kenya and container. However, unfortunately, this case also became one of the, I mean, under the investigation in Thailand because of the illegal shipment from somewhere in the world and then come to the port of Thailand. It's also being criminal case as well. Okay, next please. Then we have another request. Uh, from Thailand to Kenya in 2015. As I mentioned uh, uh, before, it also became the, the, the criminal case in Thailand. So we need, uh, we need to obtain some documents about the shipment, about the company, the identity of the company uh, from the Kenya side, but so far there's no response um, until now. Next, please. Then lastly, we have the MLA request from Kenya to Thailand in uh, 2017. Uh, again, to, uh, Kenya wants to collect, to allow the Kenya authority to collect the evidence. In some part, it can be executed and we already notify uh, Kenya authority, uh, but they can come to collect something as the observer. Uh, the second one is to receive an uh, investigation file from Thailand enforcement like uh, loyal type police or custom. Um, this is also executable and we already notified uh, Kenya, Kenya authorities. Third is to extract the DNA to prove the origin of ivory. It also can be executed, but with the condition that Kenya can do only being observer and the uh, ex uh, extraction of DNA have to be done through the DNP. And uh, next is to return the container and all the ivory back to Kenya. This is really problematic because it cannot prove that the ivory belongs to Kenya. And we, we found that if we uh, send the shipment back and if that other country also claim uh, the ivory as well, it also can be problematic. And uh, uh, both, I mean, container and the ivory are still under investigation in Thailand. And also Kenya wants to use the um, uh, CITES, uh, some, some, some article in CITES, uh, they want uh, Thai authority to give the certificate to extract some DNA, some part of the ivory back to Kenya as well, but uh, because of some obstruction in the law, we cannot do so. Lastly, to allow Thai officer or private entity involved in the case going to Kenya and give testimony in Kenya court. This is um, 
also it can already executed uh, based on voluntarily basis. And I heard that uh, many Thai, of, Thai officers already went there to give the testimony in the court. Okay, next please. Okay, the last one is ad hoc task force uh, aimed to extract the DNA from the past in 2020. I, I told, since I, I told you that the DNA extraction is prob prob problematic because we have some limitation of our technology. Uh, so there's a cooperation between custom DNP, RTP, our office, office of Attorney General and HSI of US, uh, try to extract the DNA of the ivory by sending the, the part of the ivory to Washington DC from, for some like more advanced uh, laboratory in, in DC. But so far from what I learned, um, that's still ongoing and still no progression of like how we can extract this and due to the limitation of high law. Next please. Then I would like to draw some challenge of the MLA. Um, as you know, like it's very really time consuming. Uh, by the case study I just read, uh, it's uh, been sent to Thailand in 2015 and it's already been seven years, but so far it's not been done yet. Now uh, we we'll see what's going to happen. And the difference in legal framework is another part of the problem. Um, Kenya believes that they can request Thailand to return the contender and ivory back to Kenya uh, based on the Kenya law. But in fact, since it's under investigation in Thailand, we cannot release the evidence without the court order. So that's also the difference in legal framework. Uh, limitation assistance in some type, uh, even uh, for example, even though we have a recovery mechanism, but we really, so far we cannot uh, return any asset based on the MLA. There's maybe some channel of law that can return the asset, but for the main channel, we still cannot do so. Uh, next is uh, no point of contact. For example, in the case, uh, I cannot try, I cannot contact the one real authority of Kenya, how it's going in the case. Um, so it's very important to know the point of contact. Lastly is bureaucratic system. Uh, we live in the government world. Um, I, for me, I found it also obstacle because of the level of approval. Uh, for example, if I have a case to my hand today, if I finish it, the case tomorrow, the case will go to uh, uh, section boss, the case will go to deputy director general, the case will go to director general, the case will go to deputy attorney general, and sometimes the case will go to attorney general. It will take the soonest, it will take a month to finalize uh, all the things, all the consideration. It will take another month if the request has to pass through the diplomatic channel. So it will take probably around three months uh, for the request to go out from Thailand. Then imagine how uh, it's also from the counterpart as well. I, I believe that it will take the same amount of time. So the soonest from my experience that we received the result of execution back is around seven months, six to seven months. And the longest is um, I've been working in the international affair for 10 years, over 10 years. Some case that I just set in the first day of international affair, I haven't received the result of execution yet. So that's the problem of the challenge using the MLA. Next, please. There's also the law enforcement challenge. Actually, this is the common challenge that happened, I believe, in everywhere in the world. Um, first, as there's no awareness of the available laws, and second, is no awareness of importance of the environmental case. Um, I would like to say at some point that um, many cases have, have been finished with only a charge of illegal possession of the car cast. But the law enforcement will not go further to find the syndicate or to find the kingpin behind the crime, even though that's enough evidence. There's many reasons why. First, I think that um, from my experience and from my a lot of seminar, first the law enforcement yeah. they don't know about. If I can ask you to wrap up, please. Oh. If I can ask ask you to wrap up the presentation. Thank you. Oh, okay, sorry. sorry. Okay, then um, uh, next, please. 
Okay, uh, we come to the last part of my presentation. That's a good practice of cooperation in, in Thailand uh, by raising the awareness among the law enforcement. Um, Thailand, with the support from uh, USA and WWF, uh, we create a guideline called Rapid Restraint Guide on Applicable Offense to Trafficking on Critical Endangered Species in Thailand. Uh, next, please. Uh, it's so-called the RRG. The RRG actually contain uh, a lot of brief description of important law such as POC law, money laundering, um, anti-corruption, and um, custom law, and the wildlife conservative law. And it is designed for the law enforcement, uh, for the prosecutor to how to extract the evidence, how to use the law. It's, it's very compact and concise and it's been distributed to many law enforcement. And also we have a lot of seminar and workshop thanks to uh, US State and uh, WWF to arrange some workshops in the regional office of uh, as an regional office, for example, in Chiang Rai to, to raise the awareness of the law and the importance of the uh, environmental problem, environmental crime. Okay, so all right, that's it for my uh, presentation. So I thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Thirat, for giving us that perspective from prosecution, the operational requirements for case building and for evidence, right? It's very helpful to give us a fresh perspective on how it works on the ground. And um, I see some questions in the Q&A, so please keep them coming. We'll have a good discussion later on. If you have any questions, just put them, type them here. And now we proceed to our last panelist. Uh, so our last panelist is also from the uh, Department of Justice and she is Sylvia Schwader. Sylvia is the US Department of Justice Regional Resident Legal Advisor for Counter Wildlife Trafficking, now based in Laos. And from there, she focuses on Southeast Asian countries. Before coming to the region, Sylvia spent 14 years as a federal prosecutor in New York where she handled and supervised an array of criminal cases. As General Crimes Deputy Chief, she oversaw the prosecution of wildlife trafficking, among others. And most recently, she was the Financial Litigation Unit Deputy Chief, where she handled mutual legal assistance requests. Now, prior to joining the U.S. Attorney's Office, Sylvia was a lawyer at the law firm Sullivan and Cromwell and a law clerk in New York. Now, everyone, let's all please welcome Sylvia. Sylvia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. And thank you to Sally and to Tirat for helping set the stage. Uh, this is all, it all works together. I'm going to talk to you today about financial investigations and money laundering and wildlife crime. Next slide, please. As Rocky mentioned, I'm the regional resident legal advisor for counter wildlife trafficking in Southeast Asia and I'm here from the US Department of Justice. I primarily work on training and workshops for prosecutors in Southeast Asian countries, but I can also work with judges and law enforcement officers. And my goal is to help countries focus on climbing the ladder in criminal organizations so that we can help to prosecute the kingpins of these crimes. And just like Tirat was saying, we need to work together. We need regional and international cooperation so that we are able to climb these ladders and really address the key perpetrators of the crime, which are the kingpins who are making all the money. There are other things that I can work on as well, like legislative review and case-based mentoring. And I'm open to hearing from anyone who wants to work on that with me. Next slide, please. Now, as you know, and as Sally talked about, wildlife crime is often connected to lots of other kinds of crimes, right? We all know this. Once you have wildlife crime, you sometimes have narcotics trafficking as well, or human trafficking, corruption is often involved, you see tax evasion, you see fraud, you see customs violations, weapons violations, and of course, you see money laundering, which we're gonna focus on today for these next few minutes. Now, one advantage to charging wildlife crimes, but also other crimes, is that judges and prosecutors are often more familiar with the other crimes, right? Wildlife crime 
can be pretty specialized. But if they see something that they're familiar with, they're more likely to go through with the prosecution and the judges are more likely to feel comfortable sentencing a defendant who's convicted of the wildlife crimes if other crimes that they're more familiar with are often involved, also involved. Also, the prosecutors and judges might see these other crimes as more serious than the wildlife crimes because, again, they're more familiar with them, the things they've seen before. So that also helps us. And the other crimes might have longer potential sentences and penalties. So you heard Sally mention about the kinds of limitations on some of these penalties for wildlife trafficking crimes in ASEAN. But sometimes money laundering, for example, can have the potential of a much longer sentence if a judge feels like that is appropriate in a, in a potential case. So in the United States, for example, a wildlife crime might have a maximum potential sentence of five years, but money laundering could have a 20 year maximum potential sentence. So these are just some things that help us see why it's important. It's also important because you can seize assets more easily with money laundering or other crimes than you can with wildlife trafficking. And it may make extradition possible in certain countries where there is not a dual criminality or a way to extradite for wildlife trafficking crimes that are specialized to a particular country, but the country does allow for uh, um, extradition of fraud or money laundering. Next slide, please. I'm gonna talk now more specifically about money laundering crimes and economic crimes. So we know there's a high profit margin for wildlife trafficking crimes. There's, there's um, high value in trafficking in wildlife parts. There's a high hierarchical criminal organization a lot of times. And the person, as Sally mentioned, on the bottom of the totem pole is barely making anything. They may be making $50 to kill a tiger, or they're just doing it because they need to feed their family. Is that the person we really need to be going after? I don't think so. I think we need to keep climbing up the chain and working up the chain so that we can go after the kingpin who's making millions of dollars off of this crime. And by stopping the guy at the top of the ladder, that's how you're going to end up stopping and disrupting, dismantling these organized criminal chains. Because if you just prosecute the guy at the bottom of the totem pole, the guy at the top says, well, that's the cost of doing business. I don't care much. We learn this a lot with narcotics trafficking. We would uh, prosecute the drug mules, but that didn't stop. They're so fungible. They could always find another person who had enough poverty and needed to keep bringing the drugs into, in our case, the United States. And it wasn't until we went up the chain and prosecuted the, the higher up people that we were really able to disrupt some of these horrible narcotics uh, transnational organized crimes. And that's the same thing we need to do with wildlife trafficking. Um, of course, there's also the problem that we're, it, there's a theft of shared public resources with wildlife crime. And you're going to hear in the next session from Professor Amanda Whitford talking about species victim impact statements. And I ask you to focus a lot on what she's saying because she describes how it can be valued, the loss of the wildlife crime, uh, parts to our biosecurity, our biodiversity, and of course, to the endangerment of our, and extinction potentially of our precious animal species. So these are all very important reasons why we wanna focus on the economic crimes. Next slide, please. Now, evidence is traceable through financial institutions in a way that is sometimes harder with other crimes. Now, it's important that these investigative tools that law enforcement officers and prosecutors use are um, started early and that they are started and supported in a way that allows people to take the time to go through and find the, the traceable um, proceeds. Because proving money laundering helps not just with money laundering charges, but it also provides evidence in supporting wildlife crime charges. 
And as I mentioned earlier, it allows us to prosecute the kingpins and the managers of these criminal organizations. So it's very important that we start our investigation early and that we keep in mind that there's not gonna be a victim who can come forward with the wildlife crimes in a way that with other kinds of money laundering, we might see a victim. So we, we have to be proactive in our investigations and we have to consider the fact, as Tirat mentioned, that these crimes often cross borders. And as Tirat explained, using money, mutual legal assistance is a very lengthy process. So we want to work on these financial investigations early, and we want to always consider them in the back of our mind with wildlife crimes. Uh, we have to work with other agencies when, when, we are, when we're working on financial investigations, because in the United States, for example, it's much easier for us to get tax records if we make sure to include the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, in our investigations. Or it helps us to get travel records, which are useful in our investigations if we include our customs and border protection. So we want to make sure to work together with other agencies and to work, of course, with other countries and share information, share leads, just like uh, Tirat was mentioning. Next slide, please. And as I said, proving these crimes takes time. We have to start our investigations early. We have to trace assets that, um, that will help us prove the crime and will show us where the money is traveling to. Now, freezing assets and confiscating assets take a lot of time, and they are also uh, things that require legal process. So we want to keep in mind that these kinds of parts of our investigation are going to require us to go through the courts and make sure that we have the evidence to allow the courts to give us the um, ability to freeze the assets and confiscate them down the road when a conviction has been proven. Now, uh, and sometimes we don't even need to prove a conviction to confiscate assets uh, that we can just show in other, through other methods civilly that a uh, crime had happened. Next, next uh, slide, please. We want to learn about the financial profile of our subjects not just because I said of money laundering, but also for all, all these other reasons. We're gonna learn so much about our subjects and targets when we start to see the picture of what they look like financially. Who are the targets? Who do they deal with? What transactions are occurring? Where are the transactions occurring? When are the transactions occurring? Finding this kind of information from the financial profile can also help us in other parts of our investigations because we'll be able to look for witnesses, for example, or other kinds of evidence that may have occurred. Um, maybe CCTV, maybe um, informants, maybe other, other uh, law enforcement agencies that came in contact with these same targets. We can look at bank records, wire transactions, property records, what cars are the people driving? Are they buying jewelry? What kind of financial liabilities does someone have? All of this financial picture that we have of a subject helps tremendously. Next slide, please. And we, to develop evidence, we want to look at the total expenditures that people are, are spending. So how much how much of what people are getting in and spending comes from legal income? Okay, we know this person runs a business and okay, it claims to be a legitimate business. Maybe it is a legitimate business. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Tax records show they make, you know, whatever it is, $50,000 from that business. Certain things show that they're making a legal income. Fine, that's their legal income. But then how much money are they spending compared to that legal income? We want to try to find out what comes from unknown sources because that's where we're going to find that these, this is illegitimate income. These are illegal proceeds. So we're going to try to identify those unknown sources of funds. And that's where tracing and doing a financial investigation is going to help us. We'll look at deposits, 
foreign and domestic and um, other kinds of ways that we might be able to use legal process that's appropriate in our own countries. Next slide, please. And a lot, so this is an example just on the left of looking at somebody's bank records. And it's great when you can have bank records because that doesn't lie, that's traceable. That's something that we can use to find other evidence. But a lot of the evidence comes from cash. 90% of what uh, could be illegal evidence is coming out of just plain cash. So what does that look like? Next slide, please. First, we want to get the financial records that we can and analyze the money flow because, like I said, that's traceable. We'll look at what's being deposited, what's being spent out, try to get a net worth of an individual by taking their assets, taking away their liabilities, and seeing how much money is this person worth. Next slide, please. And then we can take information from financial institutions, from FIUs, who can help us figure out in, from, with intelligence, we might not be able to use all of that information in court, but it helps propel the investigation by looking at what some countries call CTRs, cash transaction reports, or suspicious transaction reports. In America, we call them suspicious activity reports, SARS or STRs, whatever they're called. Most countries in ASEAN have these abilities for us to be able to look at things that are, that are being spent in an inappropriate way, how much cash is being used. This is where we're gonna figure out when somebody's depositing more than $10,000 of cash or they're spending you know, $70,000 in cash to buy a car. So these financial investigative units, the FIUs help give us these, this great, great intelligence. And from there we can kickstart and try to get evidence we can use in court. Next slide, please. Now, we, what we're doing, and this is just a, a picture of how, what we're looking at, but it's what I've been describing, that people are collecting dirty money. They got to put them into a bank, right? They want to get them into a legitimate place, transfer the money through many, many bank accounts, shell companies, um, using false invoices, hiding the way that they're describing the money, putting them in an offshore bank. And then eventually they're going to, of course, try to use that money to buy luxury assets or make investments with them. So it comes out clean. This is just a, a visual picture of how we're, people are trying to make the money clean, laundered through the banking system. And they're using our banking systems, our legitimate banking systems as a pawn in this game. Next slide, please. So we can look to places like foreign exchange dealers. Now in the United States, we would get a subpoena. Everybody's gonna have a different legal process or different way in their country for how they get this information. But these are great places to find evidence. Foreign exchange dealers, casinos, front companies. You know, Maybe there's a financial institution that has an insider who's helping the target or subject. As I mentioned earlier, we're looking for assets that were purchased with cash because those are things that are gonna to have to be reported. They're supposed to be reported. Somebody spending $70,000 to buy a fancy car, that amount of cash should be being reported. And then on the next slide, I'll describe structuring and, and smurfing. So next slide, please. So it can either be called structuring or smurfing, but what somebody might do is they'll take a huge, a large amount, Rocky, I see you, do I have two minutes? They'll take a large amount of money, of illicit dirty money, Okay, and then they'll, they'll break it down into smaller amounts so that they can, they can avoid having to make required, um, required reporting requirements. They might put the money into different banks or on different days, and then that's a way that they've cleaned the money. Next slide, please. And these are just other ways that money might be brought in. They might be physically brought in in somebody's taped to somebody's chest and, you know, $100,000 just taped their chest and gone through the airport. Next slide, please. And they can move money through lots of different methods, some of which we've already touched on. Next slide, please. And I want to just touch on the red flag. So when you see in your investigation that there have been payments for goods that are way beyond what they should be for the market value or way below the market value, those are red flags. When you see discrepancies in shipping documents, 
those are red flags. When the products don't align with the line of business, I had a case where they were an uh, insurance company was giving a money money to a dental lab. It made no sense. This these are all things that should tell you. Wait, that's a red flag. Next slide, please. And then the money gets stored in places that can be used later, assets like gold or diamonds, something that can be used at another time. Next slide, please. And they also often, criminals will use prepaid cards because these are totally anonymous and they can use it without identification and at any time. Next slide, please. And these, by going and using money laundering charges and recovering assets, we're doing, we're hitting the criminal where it hurts them the most, right? We're taking the money away from them we're um, helping so that that money cannot be used to fund other illegal activities. And we are doing what we hope most, which is to put the organized crime syndicate out of business and deter other criminals. Next slide, please. And please reach out to me if you want me to um, do some kind of other presentation that describes these things in more detail. Sorry if I'm over time. Thank you, Rocky. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for that very, very interesting presentation and the uh, intertwining of uh, wildlife crime with economic crimes and uh, how it can be traced to all our financial transactions. Uh, it's very interesting, all those uh, evidence that you've uh, showed us. So at this point, we are in the open forum of this session. May I call on all the panelists to please open their videos. We have some questions here and we'll have a good discussion on the topic. The first question I is from you on quick, and he poses an example. For example, he's from Malaysia, and most of the poachers um, are from other countries, uh, specifically from Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and there's been a, a, a growth in uh, these poachers. So his question is: Other than domestic laws, like how can we? Uh, what are the other options that we can take to penalize or reduce the influx of influx of identified poachers from the countries where they're coming from. So any thoughts, please? Sure. Um, one thing that you can do, of course, is what Tira has been, had been describing, which is work together with law enforcement agencies from other countries, provide those, that information informally, law enforcement to law enforcement, the, a prosecutor could get on the phone with a prosecutor from another country. An agent, a law enforcement officer can get on the phone with a law enforcement officer in another country and explain to them what the leads are and the proof and evidence in that other country so that that person can be prosecuted in mm -hmm. Laos or Vietnam or Thailand. There is, there is no reason that we should not be sharing evidence because sharing these leads is what's going to help us eventually dismantle these large criminal organizations that are crossing borders. Uh, Tira, I don't know if you want to talk more about this and I didn't mean to step on your toes. Oh, okay, thank you, Sylvia. Actually, I would like to support um, Sylvia about this. I want to give some example that I experienced myself. Um, that's a narcotic, that, um, narcotic case happened in Thailand and the Australian authorities sent the lead to us um, and eventually it, it brought to the prosecution of the, the criminal in Thailand. Everything is happening in Thailand. So I would like to say that even Malaysia cannot do anything with this posture that maybe they just sit tight in front of computer in Bangkok, but they can send sharing some evidence. So the cooperation is very important, just like Sylvia mentioned. I would like to say this is also the best way and it's another way is um, if you want to do more formal way, as I mentioned earlier, in the MLA, you also can do the criminal, uh, initiate criminal proceeding against anyone in Thailand. If, they, if you have enough evidence um, that happened everything in Malaysia, but you cannot, uh, for example, ask for some extradition from Thailand to Malaysia, uh, you can also have an option for like, uh, ask Thai authority to initiate criminal proceeding in Thailand as well. Thank you. Practical examples in leads, both at the informal levels of cooperation and also formal channels of actually prosecuting them. How about from a regional uh, perspective, Sally? Would you have any on this or? No, I think uh, Sylvia and uh, Tira Kuntira has adequately answered the question. 
And ultimately, a lot of the regional treaties and agreements also are still or international relies on national legislation and enforcement right. at the end of the day. So interagency and intergovernment uh, um, um, cooperation is key. Right. All right. And there, there's another question. I think Sylvia and Pirat, you touched on this uh, on the anti-money laundering. So how effectively uh, is anti-money laundering laws applied in the forfeiture of illicit gains from wildlife traffickers? Do you have like, any examples from your experience from the region or elsewhere on how we have, we've used AMLAX anti-money laundering laws? Oh, I think you're on mute. Okay. So some example actually is not related. It's somewhat related to wildlife case as well. A few years ago, Thailand, uh, uh, there's a request from US uh, for request for expedition of the Alexander Cat. I'm not sure you guys ever heard about him. He's the owner of the really biggest dark web in, in, in the US and actually it's around the world. And um, he, he, he cited uh, his, his place in, in Phuket or in Bangkok, I believe. And then um, uh, besides the expedition request, also the US Act for the money laundering uh, request as well. So um, actually, we forfeit, we confiscate a lot of like um, sport car, like Lamborghini, Ferrari, or any other type, like some villa in Phuket, some condominium, luxury condominium in Thailand, in Bangkok. So I would say that the way to use the money laundering uh, law is protected in Thailand. And that's, um, they don't have to prove beyond reasonable doubt in order to confiscate um, any asset in Thailand. Just if you have um, just enough the evidence to show, to show the, the crowd like some prima facie, I would say uh, that would be enough to confiscate, uh, confiscate some uh, money of the criminal in Thailand. So I think it's very effective to use um, uh, money lending as a means. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Tirat. Yes, thank you for that example, Tirat, because I don't have a lot of examples in the region. Um, and I'm not aware of in the region people really using money laundering yet with wildlife trafficking crimes. So that's why a goal of mine is that we will start to see more money laundering charges with the uh, wildlife crimes. But I will say also uh, that in the United States, it is being used successfully that we're seeing wildlife trafficking laws and money laundering laws being used together. And we, just like Tirat said, we don't have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt to be able to seize those assets. We can do it in a, in a uh, also with us in the United States in a civil burden of proof that's much, much uh, easier oftentimes to be able to seize the assets. So I really hope that we do start to see more money laundering charges with wildlife charges uh, charges here in ASEAN. Yeah, if I may just add very quickly that, you know, I, I, I am aware that in Thailand, there are a couple of cases, and there were a couple of cases, uh, the Chai Mat case, which was a very famous case, which you can just Google, uh, where the FIU, the, the Financial Intelligence Unit, uh, the Anti-Money Laundering Authority here, AMLO, um, actually worked together with the wildlife enforcement, um, 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 uh, wildlife enforcers and and they were able as Sylvia is saying you know because um, or was it Tira the the burden of proof is not that high so if it is a suspicious transaction right uh, they will be able to uh, use their powers to seize uh, or freeze uh, assets uh, which is a very very uh, useful tool when it comes to investigating um, um, and of course you know uh, if ultimately the proceeds are released because there's not enough evidence but um, that doesn't mean that it's not effective. So yes, there are some cases in Thailand. Um, I'm not personally involved, obviously, you know, but uh, we can share that. Unfortunately, uh, Kun Siri is not here. She's from the uh, anti-money laundering office in Thailand and she could have shared that too, but in another forum, thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you everyone for those examples. Very interesting, uh, more examples later on in the region for anti-money laundering charges. And uh, for the one of more one of the questions, a couple of questions actually is on the demand reduction of uh, these illegal wildlife. 
uh, what can be done like in the regional and national levels to dem reduce demand for these wildlife right, in terms of law and policy? I know Sally, you touched upon this, but maybe some more examples to elaborate further. Um, so many of the uh, initiative uh, in, in the past decades or so has uh, been um, led by NGOs, um, um, but um, more and more you're seeing a, a lot of government agencies working together with private sectors, private sectors meaning uh, uh, private companies as well as NGOs uh, in trying to uh, uh, create awareness. I think that's one thing, but and in the most recent trend in demand reduction is not about just creating awareness, right, but how to change behavior. And there's a new term which actually USAID uh, 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 Wildlife Program has uh, supported as well, which is what they call social behavioral change uh, communication. So you're not just creating the awareness, you, you have to investigate you know, or, or, or review which uh, demographic you are targeting at and, and see how you could um, um, uh, design or create a messaging that will then change the behavior of say, for example, consumers of rhino horns or consumers of ivory um, um, uh, so that it has a long-term effect, yeah. Thanks, Sally. Anyone else? As we have a, a very interesting question, Sylvia, directed towards you. And this is on to what extent are criminals actually using cryptocurrency right now to launder money in the context of legal wildlife? And how, how hard has it been to uh, apprehend and catch these? So I'm not, I'm not aware how much they're using cryptocurrency now, but generally we're seeing cryptocurrency being used on a, in a much um, more increased basis every single year because of the anonymity or the apparent anonymity of cryptocurrency. It's something that I think we're going to just be seeing more and more in the future. I don't know how much it's being used in wildlife yet, but um, wildlife trafficking yet, but I, I will say it's something we should all be aware of. We all need to learn how to, how to investigate cryptocurrency. As I mentioned, it's apparent anonymity because people did think for a long time that no one would be able to trace the money from cryptocurrency, but we're starting to see that in fact we can and we are the law enforcement agencies are starting to beat the criminals at their own game and they, there are ways to be able to investigate who is using the cr cryptocurrency and to follow and trace that money. Thank I you. don't know if Sally and, Sally and Tirat maybe have some examples more recently that I don't have. Yep. Uh, yeah. um, just would like to give some example that I just raised before is about the dark web. Actually the dark web is also contain some wildlife, uh, wildlife sale and trade. Um, at the time that uh, the authority sees the property, they also see tremendous amount of Bitcoin um, to the, the key. Uh, I know that there's uh, no actual money, but um, they, they, they see the key and they got tremendous amount of Bitcoin. So I would say that actually the criminals start using cryptocurrency long, long ago. So I, I, but I don't have the enough evidence. I think that some of my FIU colleagues can uh, elaborate more about that but maybe in the next meeting or the next hand thank you thank you Tira. very interesting sally you were saying no i i don't want to open another pandora box because when we start talking about cryptocurrency you start talking about online trading of wildlife and other counterfeit goods as well you know and, and that's a whole big topic as well but right. just <laughs> keeping that at the back of your head when you leave this um meeting <laughs> All right, we'll have another venue for that for online wildlife trafficking. And just maybe one last quick question before we wrap up. Um, it's been, uh, uh, Roshani mentioned that as more regulations are implemented, uh, more criminal groups flourish. So do you think this is correct? And aside from increasing penalties, what else can like, governments do to make it less lucrative? I, I can just briefly say that I think um, penalties, penalties first of all in the laws um, uh, would be uh, a good start. Um, but having a, a, um, a 
um, knowledgeable prosecution as well as judiciary on the seriousness uh, and impact of wildlife crime, right? It's not, it's not just an animal, it's not just an animal part, it has an impact of the whole ecosystem, which um, um, as Sylvia has mentioned um, um, in, in session five, it would be very interesting because there are innovative uh, uh, remedies uh, in terms of sentencing, in terms of, you know, um, uh, uh, species, species victim statements, how to, um, for want of a better word, right, create that awareness and educate the judiciary, the judges, the prosecutors even, right, um, that uh, wildlife crime is not just simply a small crime, it's a crime of wealth, it's not a crime of poverty. Therefore, we need to hit them where it hurts. Um. <laughs> right. I agree completely. Sylvia and Tirat, any last thoughts related to that? Um, I just. Oh. Oh, sorry, sorry, Sylvia. After you. Go ahead, Sylvia. Oh, just, I just want to amplify Sally's point that we need to seize these assets. We need to hit them, like Sally said, where it hurts. You can't just use the criminal penalties. You have to also use your abilities to seize their assets and make them stop, make them not want to or be, continue it because it doesn't make financial sense. And once they get their luxury goods taken away, once they get all the money that they made from this taken away, they can't continue to put this money into other illegal activity. Go ahead, Tira, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to support you guys that uh, we need um, effective corporate uh, prosecution. It's very important that uh, there will be meaningless if we, have, we raise the punishment level, but the, the, the prosecution is still less effective. Uh, so the raising of the awareness of the law enforcement is very important. And also uh, stop the flow of money is also one of the factors that's very important to stop the criminal. So that was my thought, thank you. All right, thank you very much for that wealth of perspective from the three of you uh, as we close this session. I'd like to thank the panel, which has shown how urgent and how hard pressed we are in actually crafting solutions to address wildlife crime. And for all the efforts, the law and policy reforms, we can actually counter illegal wildlife trade in the region. So again, I'd like to thank our panelists, Sally, Hirat, and Sylvia, and to all the participants in today's webinar for, for joining us. Um, this has been Rocky Guzman from Ariel. For the, for the next session, you may go back to the lobby, take a break for five minutes, and then proceed to the next session. It will be at 10.05 Philippine time, 9.05 Bangkok. Then, no, again, thank you, thank you for tuning in this morning, and I hope to see you in the next session. Thank Bye you. Now. Thank you, Rocky. Thank, thank you, Sylvia and Tira. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Rocky. Thank you, Sally. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.